All right. Thank you so much for joining me today. I have a guest with me today. Her name is Colleen, and I'm just really looking forward to having a conversation with her. Um, hi, Colleen. Welcome to the show. Hi, and thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, so before we get started, I'd like to maybe just tell me and the audience just a little bit about yourself and your background. Um, sure. So I am currently a stay-at-home wife and mom. I've got two toddlers at home, uh, both under the age of three. They're 17 months apart, so they keep me pretty busy. Um, before that, in another life, I was uh, I was a traveling missionary with Net Ministries and uh, domestic all over the United States, and I uh, was a missionary for teens, middle school, middle school and high school age. And then after that, I became a foreign pilgrim where I went to Europe, and I basically traveled all over Europe for various pilgrimages, including, I don't know if anyone in your audience will know what this is, but it's called the Camino de Santiago. And it's basically a 500 mile pilgrimage walk across France and Spain with nothing but a backpack and a set of walking sticks. So I did that um, on my own and that was really incredible. And then I was also a faith formation director for teens and high school, uh, for middle school and high school students in Minnesota for a few years. So that's, that's so awesome. awesome. <laughs> it's been, so I've been in Minnesota for a long time in one form or another. And then uh, back in 2017, I decided to move back from Minnesota to Louisiana, which is where I grew up, where I'm from. And a month after I moved home, I met the man that I would marry less than a year later. And we got married and we started having kids and that has led to my current situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember those toddler years very clearly and I know they can be tough and it's for sure um, transitioning from like full-time ministry to like momhood can also be hard. So I totally yeah. get that. And um, I actually grew up on the mission field. My parents are missionaries. So oh. I, I love talking to missionaries and getting to hear their stories. And I always say my retirement plan is to just travel the world and visit missionaries and encourage them and bring them maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic retirement plan. Can I, can I join you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I say maple syrup because for those of you who don't know, I'm in Canada and that's a staple. So you can't yeah, always. I'm, I'm actually, I, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when people ask what I want to do, I'm like, that's, that's my plan until the Lord, <laughs> you know, calls me home basically, or I can't do it, but, um, awesome. Um, so you shared a little bit about your journey. Can you just maybe give us like just a short testimony just before we get into the story you want to share with us? Sure. Um, so like I said, I, I grew up and I was very, very fortunate to have grown up in a strong, Catholic Christian family, I was blessed enough to have a faith life for my whole life. I didn't really ever go through a time where I doubted the presence of God or my need for faith. I was very, very fortunate in that sense. And that, but I'm, I'm very thankful that I had that because my faith in God and just, and just God, regardless of my faith in him has just carried me through so many hardships. Uh, I've gone through the death of close loved ones and um, the, and just, you know, leaving home and loneliness and, and, you know, waiting for a future spouse. And I've, I found my husband semi later in life. I was 29 when we met. So um, waiting for that man of God who was worth the wait to, to get married and, and to um, just have trust that God was, putting me where he wanted me to be when and trusting in God's timing was a very huge, huge um, trust fall for me. And yeah. finally that, that did, he finally did lead me um, where he had the perfect man for me uh, waiting for me. And it all just, and once we met, we, it all went so fast uh, mm -hmm. and like just puzzle pieces come together. It was wonderful. Um, and then after we got married, we were blessed with a beautiful baby boy. And then not long after that, very soon after that, we were blessed with a, another beautiful baby girl. 
And that is kind of where the story that I want to bring uh, bring to y'all is kind of coming from because my daughter is blessed with special needs. Mm-hmm. And our experience with her has been a roller coaster. She's um, She has two very rare conditions, one of which is called infantile spasms, which is basically a very rare and dangerous form of epilepsy found in young children. And uh, in the process of getting her treated for infantile spasms, they did a bunch of tests. And they also found out that she has an even more rare genetic disorder uh, called tuberculosis complex, which is, uh, it's a genetic condition that basically the, the gene in your DNA that is responsible for cell growth has a mutation on it so it's malfunctioning and so your body starts growing all of these random blotches of cells called tubers that are in and of themselves benign they're not cancerous or anything but you're basically growing tubers all over your body your vital organs your brain your heart your skin everywhere and depending on where they are they are and how many they are there are they can cause some very serious health problems and in my daughter's case, her name is Grace. She, um, she has about 10 of them in her brain. And that's probably what was causing the infantile spasms and all the seizures. And it's caused um, a lot of other health issues that we're having to deal with on a daily basis. And as well as, well as uh, developmental delay, just global developmental delay. She's 19 months old now. We found out about this when she was five months old. Um, but she's, she's beautiful. She's wonderful. We love her, but she's, she's definitely delayed developmentally and we're getting her as much help as we can to, to work on that. Um, my goodness. Yeah. I, first I'm, I have some kids with some things, not physical, it's more mental health with our kids, but you know, I know how hard that journey can be. Um, and so just, first of all, like, thank you for just being willing to, open that door and just to have that discussion. Cause I think a lot of parents, I don't know, I think we're really bad at just sometimes sharing the hard and just how that then makes us maybe wrestle with the Lord a little bit. (laughs) First of all, it probably, you know, uh, breaks the dam and the waterworks start. And so just, it's just actually hard to talk about it because you start getting emotional. But yeah, no, the other part is, I think as a culture, it's so, especially, um, I don't know, especially today in our generation, I feel like it is uh, such a thing to be presented as we're doing great. Like, I'm going to put this great selfie online. I'm going to talk about these great achievements that my kids are doing and sharing the hard parts, sharing the, the, the failures or the, um, the, the pain that is there is not uh, popular, I guess, because yeah. it requires vulnerability and that's hard to do. <laughs> yeah. And I think too, you know, as Christians, the Bible says to like share each other's burden, but I feel practically we have a hard time doing that. Cause like you said, we've kind of built this culture of being like, no, I love the Lord. I'm happy. I'm fine. We're good. When really sometimes we're wrestling with some pretty heavy things and certainly, you know, your child being born and having so many health issues can kind of probably cause a lot of that. Right. Um, So (laughs) yeah, thanks for being willing to have that conversation. And I hope we can just encourage others in their, whatever they're going through. Um, so yeah, take us back from the beginning. Like, did was there anything during the pregnancy, or like, how did this oh, all start? No, so we were completely blindsided by this. Um, she had had some. Uh, d- she she was slow to reach certain milestones leading up to being five months old, but okay. we didn't too much of it because we figured she just had bad eyesight. That wasn't something that we were very concerned about. She was having trouble making eye contact. She was having trouble focusing on anything, really. Um, 
And I f we figured that that was just because she had bad vision. We took her to an ophthalmologist and he said that he was very, he said that she was very farsighted um, and she probably wasn't reaching milestones, like reaching for things because she couldn't see them. So right. we didn't, we didn't think too much of it. And then when she was about, when she right at the end of five months old, so this was in November of 2021, um, she started doing this weird motion with her arms where she would mm -hmm. literally just shoot her arms up in the air and you could tell she wasn't doing it on purpose. She was surprised by it. It's like, <gasps> and then she'd be really uh, scared by it and she'd start crying and she would do it over and over and over again. And I looked at, I saw her doing it and I thought it was weird. And I, I, I kind of had a little alarm bell going off in my head about it, but there wasn't, I, I showed I showed it to my husband. I showed it to a couple other people, and and they were all just like, you know, she'll she's probably just fine. She's probably just playing. But I didn't that didn't sit well with me. So yeah. I showed my mom, who uh, also has that mother instinct, you know. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to have my mom living next door to us. So mm -hmm. I showed her, and she started doing it for her. And my mom confirmed it. Was just like, no, this isn't normal. This isn't right. Uh, she's not supposed to be doing this. And we both heard her crying. It was an in pain kind of cry. It was not her normal cry. You know, as a mom, yeah. you, know your daughter, you know your baby's cries. Uh, so I, I told my husband, we're going to the emergency room right now. And mm -hmm. we went to the ER. And we were there for like five hours. And uh, she had fallen asleep at some point. So we, I had taken videos of it. I showed them videos of what she was doing. And and of and they heard her cry and they did a chest x-ray and they did blood work and that was it and they said we couldn't find anything she's just fussy take her home you'll be fine at no point did anyone say that this could be a neurological issue no one even brought that up or or suggested exploring that up at all um so but at that point i think when they told her she, when they told us she's just being fussy she's okay i think at that moment I wanted to believe that. I wanted that to be the case. I didn't, I wanted to be the overreactive mother at that moment. Yeah. And so, so we took her home and uh, I, I slept, a, a, you know, kind of easy that night. I was worried that she was going to wake up and cry again, but I was, I, I felt better thinking that I was just overreacting. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but the next day I started texting a couple of my girlfriends saying, oh, we went to the ER last night, you know, kind of just chatting about our days. And I was telling them about the motions that she was doing. And one of my friends sent us a video of another child doing these exact same arm motions that my daughter had been doing. And the child in the video had infantile spasms. And up until mm. that time, I had never heard of that before. Right. But I did a quick Google search. And that was enough to tell me that it was serious, it was dangerous, and it needed to be treated right away. So I, I showed the video to my husband, and then I got on the phone with my daughter's pediatrician. And uh, I told I told them, hey, I think my daughter is having infantile spasms. She needs an EEG now. And that's I, Google had told me that they needed an EEG to diagnose it. So I said, she needs an EEG today. And they told me, well, she we can refer her to this other hospital that's like an hour away and they can try to they can try to because there's a really long line to the neurology department here but we can refer you to this other hospital and they can try to get you in and i said no nope, that's not okay because we had i had brought up concerns a month earlier about her eyes and her not reaching milestones and i said could this be something else and they and they just you know kind of to to make me happy they had sent a referral into this other hospital but this other hospital had been giving me the runaround for a month and we still hadn't even had an appointment yet yeah. so um so i told him no we i don't want to go to this other hospital she needs an eeg today and yeah. <laughs> they put me on hold <laughs> <laughs> so um came back and they said okay well if you want to have the eeg here we can put you on the schedule we have the next appointment is about a month from now and i said darling i hear what you're saying and i understand what you're saying but i need you to hear and understand me that my daughter needs an eeg today 
Yeah. And I can't hold again. Uh, <laughs> and so she went and she, and I guess she went and talked to the pediatrician and then they came back and they said, okay, uh, we can get you in for an emergency tomorrow. Wow. Okay, we'll go, we'll, we will, we will wait until tomorrow. And throughout the day, Grace kept on throwing her arms up and I was on Google looking up everything that I could and everything I was finding out was scary. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we took her in for her appointment the next day and it was my husband and our son and my daughter and me, we all went in. But my, my son, who at the time was not even two years old yet, was not gonna sit still for the, for the appointments. Yeah. My husband stayed with him in the waiting room and I brought Gracie in and uh, they had to put all these wires on her head and I had to try to keep her calm. And then she finally fell asleep. And I, and I basically, my job was to keep her still and keep her asleep for the EEG. And um, so I'm, if you picture, if you will, I'm laying down in a hospital bed. I've got my daughter sleeping in my arms with a bunch of wires connected to her head. And then the, 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 the EEG technician is there and she turns the machine on. The neurologist is not actually in the room, uh, but yeah. like 30 seconds after she turns on, the technician gets on her phone and she starts texting like crazy. And I'm looking at her and, and uh, I'm asking, is everything okay? And she puts the phone down and she looks at me and she says, I'm not the neurologist and I'm not qualified to give a diagnosis, but I know that if this was my daughter, I would want to know your daughter has infantile spasms. And so I'm just laying there. I can't move because I'll wake up my daughter, but I just start crying on the hospital bed there. Just, just I know that this is serious and, and gonna have um, serious implications for her life. And I'm just, I'm, they, and I'm just, I'm just scared at that point. Yeah. I'm, my daughter and I'm scared for, for what's going to happen next because I don't know what's going to happen next at this point. Yeah. So they admit us back to the ER and they order like a hundred tests. We ended up staying at the hospital for three days wow. and the process of all of those other tests. That's when they come and they told me that, uh, and my husband, my husband and I, that it looks like she's also got this genetic disorder called tuberous sclerosis complex. And again, I had never heard of that before. So I got on Google and everything about that was scary. And it was just, it was a very, 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 uh, I keep coming back to the word scary. It was a scary time. Um, yeah. And I found it was really, um, it was very eye opening for me because all of a sudden the life that I thought my daughter was going to have, that I thought our family was going to have, that I was going to have, was in an instant gone. She, yeah. she wasn't going to have the future that I thought she was going to have. And up until that moment, I didn't even realize how much I had taken for granted or just assumed and presumed that she would have. And then when it's all suddenly gone, I didn't realize how attached I was to it. I didn't hmm. realize, um, how much it meant to me that she would, that she would grow up and maybe get married one day, that she would have friends and go to a normal school and, uh, and, and I don't know, have a career if she wants, or, you know, just so many little things that most people just kind of assume that their kids will have. And then all of a sudden it's, it's not there anymore. Totally. And I think that like, again, my kids have different issues, but it's like suddenly your milestones mm -hmm. become very different. And I <laughs> talked to one of my friends about it and it's like, oh, you know, parents of neurodiverse kids, you know, it's like they brush their hair with ha having a meltdown and as parents were like, it's a win. And then like parents of normal kids are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's this weight of like, not only knowing that they're different and that they're struggling and you really can't do much about it, but then it's like, yeah, it, it's not those normal milestones and the things that you're celebrating. It's like, it's this mixture of celebration, but also this continual feeling of like lost opportunity. And so it can be quite 
heavy almost every day because these things, these small things happen every day, right? And they they accumulate and it's it's a heavy weight to carry. It really, it really is. And I I I like it too. I think I really did go through a grieving process. Not yeah. necessarily through uh not necessarily grieving a death but grieving a life that i didn't get to live and that my yeah. daughter and it was a re and and also um the thing about tuberous sclerosis is that it is autosomal dominant which means that if she should ever have a child that child every child that she has would have a 50 50 percent chance of inheriting this tuberous sclerosis and there's such a broad spectrum that child's case could be much more mild than Gracie's, or it could be drastically more severe. So it is a very big decision and a very big risk for her to have children. And so I think that like that was one of the biggest things, one of the first things that really came to my to my head and my heart of just I may not get to have grandkids by her. Yeah. And that yeah. that has become such a huge thing because I live next door to my parents. And I see yeah. my parents enjoying my kids living next door. And I had, I didn't realize how much I was looking forward to that, getting to be in the grandparent role when my kids yeah. grow up. And now seeing that that may never happen, at least not with children from my daughter. And yeah. that was, again, it was a grieving process, grieving grandkids that I never got to have, grieving so many little things. And yeah. it was grieving, but it was also a purging process. Mm. Because again, there were all of these things I didn't know I was clinging to these attachments, these earthly attachments that I didn't even realize I had. And yeah. I have had many experiences like this in, in my life where really, really hard, um, uh, painful experiences that I'm going through turn out to be God on a rescue mission for my heart because yeah. it it's, it's painful to detach, but mm -hmm. I'm in detaching. You're becoming free to love yeah. him more, cling to, to God more fully, more completely. And that is what we all need to do. With totally. And I think it exposes like, because I remember going through a scenario where it was basically like I was angry because we weren't able to, you know, have the income we wanted and live the way we wanted. And I was like, you know, yelling at the Lord saying, why can't we blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I didn't realize how materialistic I was until I was in that position. Yeah. And you're right. Like it really does get to those really dark corners that you never think existed in your own heart, exposes them. <laughs> You know, and then you kind of have to like wrestle them through, mm -hmm. you know, with the Lord and, you know, come out on the other side, but it's, it's not an easy process. And it's, I find it's always surprising because it's like, oh, I didn't even realize that was in my heart. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's amazing, you know, we, it's our hearts, but it's amazing how much we don't know about our that our hearts are attached to. And that is one of the strategies of the evil one to hide things from us. But that is, that is, again, it's, it's, it's a rescue mission of yeah. God calling me to, to let go and to have faith in him and to walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. And as I like, I like the word wrestling that you keep using, mm -hmm. that that is a very accurate imagery of what I was dealing with. And I was wrestling with, yeah whole thing and I'm and I I was very sad a lot of the time and um and just trying to 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 grieve and to um also trying to love my daughter and yeah. care for her and trying to put her needs first which made me feel like I needed to put myself on the back burner which didn't help in me trying to deal with all the things that were going on in my own heart so it was just it was a storm yeah, that, yeah. and through that in that in the midst of that experience mm. i found myself inspired to write and relation okay. in the form of creativity mm. what ended up happening two things happening two sorry two things happened um one i was inspired to write a children's book um it's called god's precious gift a special needs child and i wrote it for my daughter about my daughter mm. and it's about 
God's love for children with special needs. And it's told from the perspective of a child uh, as she is being diagnosed with a difficult diagnosis and parents struggle with that. And in bringing her and in hearing that her parents bring it to prayer where Jesus answers them. Hmm. This book was kind of divinely inspired a little bit because I didn't have the answers that went into this book. I wasn't thinking this. And I think God just kind of gave me the words to put in this book as an answer to my own prayer of just, uh, and, and in the book, the parents are praying that God fixes their baby and Jesus answers, fix your baby. But she's already exactly the way I chose to make her. And yeah. then, uh, but the doctors say that there's something wrong with her. Like, no, do you think I make mistakes? I have known that this child was going to be yours long before you were even born and preparing you to be this child's parent your your entire life. And I've given you the graces you need for this. And this child is already so deep and incredibly loved by me. And she is going to be, she, I gave her to you as a gift because in loving her and caring for her and all of the special ways that she, that's going to be your pathway to heaven that I have prepared just for you. And yes. it's uh, like, so, so that's, that's where all of that came in. Uh, and, and that was very consoling and that was wonderful. Uh, that was very, very helpful for me. And then the other thing that happened, that was, that was one was I wrote a book. And then the other thing was, um, I did mention that I had walked the Camino de Santiago. So, uh, the Camino de Santiago translated into English is the way of St. James. Saint James mm. the uh, and St. James, the apostle is credited as being the first pilgrim um in in church history because he he traveled i think uh, he traveled to spain and he he was uh he was a a missionary there basically so um so just drawing that so i ended up i've always had a connection with saint james because of that so i ended up reading the book of saint james the book yeah the book of james and uh it is just so so rich with scripture and with words of relevance to exactly what I was going through. Um, and right down to the attachments that I, that I was talking about, where, where is it? Um, like James, I've got all these written down because I knew I was going to butcher quoting them if I didn't have them written down. It says James 4, 3, it says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And mm. And you know what? That is so true. I wanted these things for my daughter, not for God's glory, but for, for myself. And because I wanted her to have this life. It, this wasn't what was going to get her to heaven. This wasn't, was it, this wasn't what was going to get me to heaven. I just wanted these things for, for selfish reasons. And God took them from me to, to cure me of that, basically. And then the other one that really, um, I mean, there's tons of them. But I, I could pretty much read the entire book of James to you. But <laughs> but another another one is um, from James one. It says, "Consider it pure joy, sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything." And that really home and, and that was comforting to me thinking that okay these trials are not trials for trials sake they are producing something to me that is going to bring me to heaven it's going to bring my daughter to heaven and it's going to help me lead my daughter to heaven in every way that i can and uh perseverance and it says to count your trial which is you know easy to say but uh <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it, it really helped bring about a mindset shift that I think I really needed <laughs> at the time because I was in a very sad place. And it really just helped me. It, it reminded me that God has a plan and God yeah. is with me in all of this. And he's, he's not trying to punish me. He's not trying to, he hasn't made a mistake and forgotten about me. He is sending me what I need. To bring me closer to him so that I can make it to heaven to be with him forever. That is 
that is the whole point of it all. And yeah. that's kind of what I learned. And that was very much consoling. So that was the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I mean, and heartbreaking and I can relate to so much of it. Um, certainly when you mentioned, you know, your daughter or not, you know, it being a risk of her having kids and, mm -hmm. you know, as a mom of myself with kids and, you know, um, anxiety and all these other things that we deal with in our family and they're genetic and it's going to be a conversation I'm going to have to have with my kids. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like these conversations that a lot of people don't even think they need to have. Mm -hmm. And it's this like, it's just another way of like, no, this is something that's very real that you have to talk to them about, that you're going to have to process with them. And yeah, I'm not looking forward to that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but then it's like finding the Lord in those things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that you mentioned that you had to detach yourself of, you know, a few things and you learned so much. And if it's okay with you, I think I'd like to, maybe have you think of just like one thing that you were attached to and just kind of the process of like what it was, you know, the actual process of like, oh, this is what you're believing in, how you were feeling when the Lord's like, no, you got to detach yourself and kind of that, like from start to finish. Does that make uh, sense? Oh man. I think, okay. <clears throat> so detaching myself from the idea that my daughter was going to be a, a, a neurotypical child. Yeah. yeah. Um, because we didn't know what damage had been done at first from the infantile spasms. We didn't know um, how much or how little damage had been done. So especially at first i was holding out hope that we had caught it earlier and early enough so that we could get her on medication and stop the seizures and she would develop normally because there are stories of kids who who are able to do that who have yeah. who, who are able to basically make it through unscathed and i held out hope for that um for for a while and then as time went by, we did get her seizures under control, thank goodness. But then as time went by, and we went to see more doctors, um, we got her in to see specialists for her specific um, conditions. And the doctors basically were telling us, no, she's delayed. She hasn't reached this milestone yet. She, We need to get her into therapy for her to be able to learn how to... Um, how to eat, how to walk, how to um, do all of these, how to how speech, uh, how to talk, uh, get her into speech therapy to learn how to talk. And all of these, um, all these little things that started adding up and, and kind of put one more nail in the coffin of, no, she's not, she's not going to be typical, neurotypical. And now she, and then she started, as she really started growing, she started developing, um, or exhibiting, I should say, uh, these red flag behaviors for autism. Mm. Um, I had, I knew to be looking out for because I think it's something like 70% of the people who have tuberous sclerosis complex also end up developing um, some level of autism. So she's on a waiting list right now to be, to be evaluated for it, but I am now 100% convinced, even without the evaluation, that she has autism. And she is, I think, I think it really drove home for me. Let's see, this was all about a year ago. She first started having infantile spasms in November of last year. Um, no, sorry, not last year, of, of 2021. We're in, we're in 2023 now. I'm still getting yeah, used to that. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> and uh so it's just over a year um so i'd say it took me a good six to eight months of watching her and um 
and and hold it. I think the, I think the good way of summarizing it is that I kept on holding out hope that it wasn't true. So I guess yeah. the way of saying that is denial. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's it, but I kept on hoping that she could still catch up. She could still um, once her brain has time enough to heal, it will develop and it will and it will uh, and she'll be able to grow and blossom and and grow into a, a child who can have a conversation with me and um experience things like a like a neurotypical child would and i think by the time she turned a year old i was pretty convinced that that wasn't going to happen and when that station and i i remember it i was in church um and i was just I was I was just praying praying about it was Sunday mass I was just praying about Gracie and I had been praying for a miracle ever since we learned about all this I've just been praying God please heal my daughter please heal her and it was right about the time that I was inspired to write the uh, my children's book and it was the children's it was the words that went into the children's book that were kind of my realization that no this is i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fix your daughter i have given you a daughter that you were not you were not expecting but she is a gift and yeah. even though that realization when you step back from it can be a beautiful and joyful thing when i realized it i just cried i was just so so sad and and just because i was still holding on to i still wanted her to have a normal life I know that there's going to be so so many more hardships for her. Yeah. But, um, that a neurotypical child may not experience. But I also realized that the saving grace is because she's not neurotypical, she may not perceive it as hardship. Yeah. And she, like, to her, it's just going to be her life. The only one who's going to suffer by seeing the difference is me. Yeah. And I can either allow myself to suffer from it or just love her the way she is. And that is so much easier said than done. I say that, you know, now, like it, it sounds, it sounds like a, um, this, um, it, it, it sounds almost like a slogan or something or, or bumper yeah. sticker. Um, it really is. It's just the only, the only person that is going to suffer from this is me and only if I choose to let it. Um, and again, that it's just painful. The truth hurts. <laughs> the truth really does hurt. Yeah. Um, and that's, that was the process. I think it took, it, it took about six months and it took, God is so gentle with mm. all gentle with me. And instead of kind of a clean break, cutting it all away from me at once, he allowed time to just whittle down at those little hopes that I was holding out for. He allowed time to just a little bit at a time, a little piece at a time. No, I know you're holding on to this, but just let's take away this this little bit and take away this little this little hope that you've got. And eventually you realize so much of it has been taken away that there's not much left. Yeah. And, and either now now you've I've taken away what you were holding on to. Now look what I've given you. Yeah. And and that's what the process was. Yeah. <laughs> and I know it's like, as we talk about it, I mean, it always sounds so easy, but it's, I mean, I've been through it. And when you said like a six months, I'm like, oh man, that was fast. Like, <laughs> I know that for me, you know, like sometimes, yeah, last year I, I processed a lot of our journey and it, it had been years in the making of just then having that time and state space to process it, you know? And when I think about my kids, it's like, unfortunately they do understand the difference. And mm -hmm. so it, it does hurt them sometimes because they can see for themselves, you know? And so we have a lot of conversations about that. And of course, like, I want to, I want to heal them. I don't want them to feel different, you know, but it's, it's hard. And it's this balance between, um, praying for healing but mm -hmm. also accepting God's response, right? 
Yes. And that it's like, you kind of have to hold both. Mm -hmm. um, and being in a space to be at peace with both. And I, I find that to be hard because it's like, right. I do want her to be healed. You know, we had this moment a few months ago where I realized like, oh, I, I pray that my kids, my daughter specifically, she has ADHD and dyslexia mm -hmm. and she was having a whole whack of issues. And I was like, man, like she's been on meds forever. Like maybe he has healed her and we just don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's like, okay, let's take her off the meds. Let's see what happens. And it's like, you know, two days in, it's like, nope. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's this continual process of like, you know, the trusting and the growing and which with every, um, milestone, it's kind of like rinse and repeat. Cause they're, you know, a new milestone will bring new loss, right. Uh -huh. Or new trust or new, whatever that is. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think sometimes like for me, it's like, man, my kids, like my oldest is 13, and it's been 13 years of like rinse and process and growth and like, the, you know, and it's, it's long and it's hard. And, you know, in that process, not letting go of the Lord, you mm -hmm. know, like reminding myself, like, no, it's, it's still good. Yeah. <laughs> also a consolation and a mercy that God has in that those little, your milestones get much smaller but your celebration of those milestones explodes tenfold. So the tiniest yeah. thing that they are able to do, your celebration of that feels like they just climbed a mountain. And oh, yeah, for <laughs> sure. That I remember uh, we've been watching, not that I'm promoting a show, but we are watching Young Sheldon, and I'm not sure you've watched it, but basically it's this boy who is a genius, which we don't like. Our kids aren't geniuses, but he has some social issues. Um, and he's quite a germaphobe. And so usually, you know, like when the family holds hand, he's like wears mittens so that he doesn't touch anybody's hands. And the scene maybe lasted like 30 seconds. And he took off his mitten and held his dad's hand. And the voiceover was like, and that was the first time I held my dad's hand. And my husband and I are like, <laughs> ah! <laughs> you know, like bawling our eyes out understanding oh. the magnitude of that moment yes but also how like people who have neurotypical children not understanding what a huge moment that was mm -hmm. and so like you said like being able to look at your kids and celebrate them for their milestones mm -hmm. and putting it in perspective to them and not letting outside opinion and standards mm -hmm. take that away from them, you know? And it's, yeah, like you said, those milestones are smaller, but they're, I mean, it's like the celebration is huge. <laughs> they, from the outside world, they look smaller, but you know that how big they are. You, yeah. You know how huge they are. Yeah. And I think there's milestones like for the kids, but also like the family and even as a mom, you know, like, oh, I, <laughs> that didn't surprise me or, oh, I handled that really well, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so I know you shared a few verses, um, mm -hmm. you know, ones that really kind of helped you through the process. Was mm -hmm. there one in particular that really you know, carried you through or just that got, gave you that peace in this process? I think, I think one really good one that did help a lot, what it had, it came with a lot of consolation is uh, James 1 12. It said, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Mm. And that was, it was consoling and it was, it helped with perspective, with understanding that I'm not working for this world. The things that I want shouldn't be for this world. They should be for my reward in heaven, for, for my time in heaven. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm working towards. And 
<laughs> you don't need to go looking for trials. If they'll find you, but to persevere through them, which is what God is asking me to do. There will be consolation. He'll be here with you through it every step of the way. And there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. It will be for a reason. It's not pointless. And that was, that was really big for me. That was really, really helpful for me. And also I've got just like, it's not a verse necessarily, but this image in my head of just God holding me in his arms and just letting, yeah. letting God, letting Jesus just, oh, sorry. Uh, letting Jesus just hold me and just pull on, just carry every step of the way that we're going. He's there. He has carried my cross and I am carrying, no, sorry. He, I'm carrying my cross, but he's carrying me. And yeah. that, that is the image that I have. In my, and that has been very consoling as well. I, I think that, I'm, I mean, I, I was going to use the word funny, but it, I mean, it's really not funny, but I was like, oh, I have the same image too. And it's exactly <laughs> like, so all three of my kids are snugglers. And oh. so I have spent, I mean, at this point years with all three of them, just like in my lap. And so you know, when I think about the Lord, I think about my kids and how they snuggle up to me. And that's, you know, it's like, I just picture myself just climbing into his lap and just resting there. And, you know, like, I know why my kids come to me for that. And I, I come to the Lord for the same thing. And that's what he calls us to is to come to him like that dad, you know, mm -hmm. Abba father means daddy, daddy. And yeah. he, he wants, he's calling us to his lap and to climb in and to, tell him all the things that are hurting us and making us worried. And, and then, you know, us as parents, I, I really have no power to change much about my kids scenarios, yeah. um, but, but just knowing that he does. And mm -hmm. so, you know, he, we have access to the one person who can change things. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes as Christians, we focus too much. I'm like, Oh, well that means, he's going to take things away. Um, but the more I come to him, it's the more I realize it's like, well, no, he doesn't necessarily change the scenario. He changes me. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I can then look at this as something like you said, like it's now a gift. Yeah. And I think like, I struggled a lot with this because you know, the verse about being like, well, children are blessing. And I'm like, okay, really? Like we've had a lot of hard, um, but as I've processed, I realize the blessing is what I've learned about God and who he is through being a parent and how I'm not sure I would have ever understood him as father had I not had children. Yes. And yes. so every time I'm having interactions with my kids, it's reminding me how much more than the Lord is to me. Uh -huh. You know, when my kids are like, yeah, you know, I hate you. You're blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I know what's best, you know? Yeah. And, I, and, and it's like, as I'm saying that, I know the Lord's looking at me and going, I know what's best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you're absolutely right. Yeah. No. And it's, and there were, there are some other verses that um, on the back of the book that I that I wrote, I have basically a letter. A, well, it's in a voice note bubble, but it's like it's it's a compilation of these different Bible verses that comprise into a, a letter for the reader. And mm -hmm. and it's all about here. I'm going to I'm going to read a piece if that's OK. Yes, says, please. Okay, uh, and these are all different Bible verses from different books, but it's it comes together. Um, peace I leave you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Trust me, I will not abandon you. Before me, no creature is hidden. Hmm. Oh, no, I lost my place. Before you, no creature is hidden. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I can you your body is a temple of the holy spirit within you you are not your own i created you fear not for i have redeemed you i have called you by name you are mine 
I love mm. you. And Amen. those are, those are all those are all different Bible verses from all over the Bible, but they kind of just all came together for me. And they went into my book as just like this is God's way of saying of of speaking to me the way I needed to hear it at the time of not as not as the world gives do I give and because the world if the world had been the one to give me uh the child or even if I who am who who am so attached to the world had chosen I would have chosen a, a neurotypical child I would have chosen a child who doesn't have to who doesn't have to deal with these with these um differences and but God knows better like yeah. he <laughs> yeah because um, he's a dad yeah exactly and i mean like going back to like having that conversation with my girls it's like i didn't know that that's what we were walking into mm -hmm. you know now i know that that's is a very high possibility for them but it's like well maybe the lord wants them to say yes without knowing right because it's like had i known i i might have chose differently but it's what god wants for me and so it's for sure one of those things that i think about that you know the lord gives us these hard things to make us more like him to bring us to him mm -hmm. because you know like there's nowhere to go but to him when you really let go of all the other things yeah you know yeah so I, yeah, I'm really just touched by your story and I just really love how the Lord has helped you process it. And I know there'll be hard things in the future, but I think that the foundation you've built for yourself is really going to be helpful. So that compilation of verses, I think is such a great prayer, but also worship, just knowing that you know, this is who God says he is. This is who God says we are to him. Yeah. Um, and that truth is so powerful when we're going through trials. Yeah. Yeah. So if people, if you're listening and you, um, you know, maybe you don't have neurotypical children or even, you know, you may be struggling some things with your kids. Um, I hope it's been encouraging to you, but Colleen, let us know where can people find this book that you've written? Has it been published? Can people get it, a copy? Yes, it has been published. They can buy it on my website, uh, www.godspreciousgift.com. It is also available on Etsy and it's available on Amazon. Um, awesome. Yes. So you can get it all three of those places. Um, and on my website, I've got a lot of information about my daughter, Grace, who inspired the book and prayer intentions and mm. all of them. I really encourage people to come and see my website. So that's for sure. And, uh, in the notes of the show, I'll make sure to put those links up for people who want to check that out. Um, sure. thank you, Colleen, for sharing your story and just for being open about the things that you struggled with, but also just how the Lord's, you know, been so gentle through this whole process with you. Um, and I know he'll continue to do that as you move forward. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful getting to sit here and talk with you and just be a part of this. This has been wonderful. Yeah. Therapy, okay. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All okay. right. Bye. Bye.